Plexta Project. I follow Franz inside and close the door behind me. Franz moves to the front, facing the students, while I go take a seat at the back. I can feel the students' eyes following me. They're probably wondering why there's a girl without a proper school uniform joining the class. I'm excited to be attending a lesson, but I'm also nervous because I feel like I'm not supposed to be here. Good afternoon, class. Professor Poe is absent again today, so I'm standing in for him again. Lucky you. Last time, we learned about one of the fundamentals of magical science, which is the magic formulae. Today, I'm going to talk about another important thing that happens to be closely related to magic machines. If you don't know what a magic machine is by now, I suggest you drop out of school, because you are dangerously unobservant. They're everywhere, all around us. Now think about your average magic machine. There are some simple magic machines whose function is limited to one magic spell. For example, your stove can only cast fire. However, many magic machines are more complex, usually involving a combination or a series of magic spells. Omnibuses, for example, can nullify gravity and transform the movement of air. In this case, the magic of an omnibus can't be adequately described with just a magic formula, which is why there is another model that's a little more complex called a magic system. Hearing Franz say a magic system reminds me of Professor Poe's room, the Magic Systems Laboratory. A magic system is formally defined as a combination or a series of magic spells that act upon a set of inputs to produce one or more outputs. Write that down. So, going back to the omnibus, you could say that an omnibus machine is a magic system that takes the omnibus, the driver's willpower, and the driver's faith to create motion. In this case, there are three inputs, omnibus, willpower, faith, and one output, motion. Basically, anything that uses magic to process something into something else is a magic system. It doesn't even have to be a magic machine, for example. Hmm. When Franz is thinking, his eyes meet mine. For example, the assembly line in a factory. To produce a chassis for a magic machine, first chunks of metal are deposited into a furnace, and then a factory worker melts the metal with fire. I was that factory worker. The liquefied metal is then transferred to a mold, and another worker turns the metal back into a solid by absorbing its heat using another spell. The result is our chassis part. And that other worker was Jude! It was done by two human magicians, but the process is a magic system that takes two inputs, metal chunks and courage, to produce an output, a chassis. Whoa! I never knew that I was a component of a magic system! Last time, we learned about how we could use a magic formulae as a notation to describe magic spells. Now, how do we describe a magic system? What kind of notation do we use? Franz pauses, waiting, but the students stay quiet. Doesn't anyone know the answer to Franz's question? I certainly don't. I don't even know what a magic formula is. For this purpose, we have something called a magic system diagram. Of course! A magic system diagram to describe a magic system! I could have guessed that. Let me show you what it's like. Franz turns his back on the students to face the blackboard and starts drawing something. This is the magic system diagram of a simple water dispenser. You can choose whether you want cold water or hot water, and the dispenser will dispense the water you choose. In a real machine, this choice may be represented by the position of a lever. Uh... What does that diagram mean? It makes no sense to me. As you can see, when the machine is in cold mode, it summons water by using intelligence, and then the heat is nullified from the water. We get cold water as a result. When it is in hot mode, the machine still summons water, but now the water is heated using fire, and we get hot water as a result. That's how we describe a water dispenser as a magic system that takes intelligence and courage to produce hot water and cold water. Hmm, I'm still quite confused, but I think Franz's explanation helps a little. After that, Franz continues explaining about magic systems, but his explanation makes less and less sense to me. This reminds me of what Gessling told me yesterday. The magicians in his homeland can cast more powerful magic spells 
But Overturian scientists know better ways of using magic, as well as practical applications of magic. There is more to magic than just casting spells. What Franz is teaching right now is the science of magic. Well, that's the end of today's lesson. The students shuffle out of the classroom, wearing as evidence on their faces. I guess I wasn't the only one who couldn't understand Franz's teaching. Magical science is sophisticated. After all the students have left, I rise from my chair and skip over to Franz. Thank you for the lesson, Mr. Byron. How did you like it? I'm baffled. This sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> We exit the classroom and head to the entrance, where we're to meet up with Aretha. I'm still fascinated by everything in this school. This is the first time I've seen so much magic in one place. I would love to take my time looking around, but Franz is walking pretty fast. Well, I understand that everything here is normal to him, because he's been seeing it every day for years. Near the entrance, we see Aretha, already waiting for us, waving her hand energetically as soon as she spots us in the distance. yoo -ho, Elise! <laughs> Hi, Aretha! Yo, Aretha! Elise, it's time to go home! Let's go! The glow in Aretha's eyes is as bright as the glow of magic, lighting up her already bright smile. Calm down, Aretha. You'll scare her away. Elise, come on! Let's go! You're even ignoring me now, huh? I'm starting to get jealous. Aretha sulks and turns her face away from Franz. <sighs> Men, they never pay attention to you when you're nice to them, but when you ignore them, they demand attention. <clears throat> yeah, right. As if anyone could stop paying attention to someone as loud as you. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few seconds ago, Aretha seemed to be upset at Franz. But now they're both laughing. Uh, these two have an interesting relationship. Um, I'm going back with Aretha now, right? Oh, ho, ho. unless you want to spend another night with Franz. I wouldn't mind. <laughs> no, I was just making sure. <laughs> A little bit of advice for you, Elise. For the sake of your sanity, don't take everything Aretha says seriously. <laughs> Let's go, Elise! Okay! Bye, Franz! What do you mean, bye, Franz? We'll be taking the same omnibus. Aretha takes my hand and leads me out of the school building. Um, bye, Franz? <sighs> Franz, Aretha, and I sit together on the omnibus, having small talks along the journey. We talk about everything from Franz's and Aretha's activities in school to my work at the factory. Occasionally, Franz and Aretha would tease each other too, which I now understand to be their way of having fun. I used to think that the bourgeois despised us proles, but maybe that's not how it is. It's just that there is this social barrier that is preventing the two groups from communicating. For some reason, Franz, Aretha, and I are able to get past this barrier. And that reason is probably my magic, because that's the common ground between me trying to fix the piano and Franz's research. Without my magic, I'd still be living at Maison, if not on the street. Magic saved me. This must be the purpose of magic. This must be why this world has magic. Why the world needs magic. Magic gives us hope. Magic is hope. Okay, this is my stop. Franz rises from his seat. Goodbye, girls. Bye, Franz. Bye, Franz. After the omnibus takes off again, I talk to Aretha. You and Franz are really close, almost like a couple. Yeah, we get that a lot, but we aren't a couple. You totally suit each other. Do we? <laughs> I'm not too sure about that. We're best friends, but I don't think romance will work out for us. Besides, sometimes when you're really close to someone, going into a romantic relationship with them would just feel like a downgrade. Know what I mean? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Have you known him long? Is he your childhood friend? Is high school still childhood? Then yeah. 
Franz and I met at a conservatoire event in our freshman year. I was hanging out with some of my girlfriends when I noticed Franz standing alone. I thought he was shy or didn't have any friends, so I went to talk to him. It turned out, he just found the event incredibly boring and couldn't wait to go home. He's such a sourpuss. <laughs> Franz has always been like that. It's not like he doesn't have any friends, but he isn't close to most people. I see. That's why I was surprised to find you at his apartment this morning. <laughs> so that's how it is. Now that I think about it, I didn't see Franz chatting with any other students at school. Maybe Aretha's letting me live with her because I'm one of Franz's few friends. Wait, am I even his friend? We only got acquainted with each other because of his research. Look, we've arrived. Oh! Franz doesn't live far from here! Nope, he's only one stop away. I follow Aretha off the omnibus. Unlike Franz, Aretha lives in a house. It's nowhere near as high class as Frederick's house, but still luxurious compared to anything you can find in the slums. I used to think that all bourgeois were rich, but there are social classes even among them. It's just not as obvious as the difference between the bourgeoisie and the proles. To us proles, though, these people are so far above us that it's hard for us to see any difference between them. The first thing I notice when I enter Aretha's house is a counter and a row of seats lining up against the wall. It strikes me as odd. How many people live here that you need a whole row of seats? A door opens and a woman emerges from inside a room. Welcome home, Aretha. Oh, you're bringing a friend over? Hi, Mom. This is Elise. Good evening, ma'am. My name is Elise Shelley. Elise Shelley? It's my pleasure to meet you, Elise. My name is Alanis Blyton. My patients usually call me Dr. Blyton, but you can call me Alanis. Alanis has a warm smile. She's very composed, unlike Aretha, who is constantly beaming with energy. It's my pleasure to meet you too, Alanis. Um, are you a doctor? Yes, I am, though most likely not the kind of doctor you have in mind. Huh? Don't all doctors heal patients' wounds and cure diseases? Not all of them. My healing isn't done with magic. She smiles softly with a mysterious glimmer in her eyes. I heal people's minds. I'm known as a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist? Elise, do you know about magic systems? I just learned about them a couple of hours ago! Yes, kind of. What do you think would happen to a system if one of its components broke? Oh, I know this one! If it happened in my chassis machine, I'm sure the whole system would stop functioning. Well, that's not always... <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Aretha wanted to say that some machines are equipped with a fail-safe that keeps the most important functionality working even in the event of a failure. But generally speaking, Elise, you are correct. The system would not be working as intended if a component failed. A human being is also a system, and that system starts with the mind. So when the mind breaks down, we have to do something about it. We study magic as a science, and science is rational, but as long as there is human element in magic, it will never be completely rational because humans are irrational. In order to fully understand magic, we must understand the human mind. And so you study the human mind? That is correct. Wow, that's interesting. We both fall silent as I try to grasp the meaning of Alanis' explanation. Aretha breaks the silence after a while. Mom, Mom, Elise doesn't have a home. Can I keep her, please? I like the way Aretha talks. It feels like I'm a stray cat she found on the street. She's cute. <laughs> doesn't have a home? Aretha explains my circumstances to her mom. <laughs> Hearing her daughter's explanation, Alanis breaks into laughter, losing the cool composure she's been keeping until now. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Elise, I think you of all people should understand exactly what I was saying about irrationality. Huh? 
trying to revive a broken piano? You do realize that all science we know to this day doesn't agree with that line of reasoning, don't you? Uh-huh. Oh. But that is exactly why the human mind is so interesting. Humanity never stands still because there are always people like you who aren't afraid to challenge common sense. Anyway, we happen to have a spare bedroom, so I, personally, would be happy to take you in our home. Welcome home, Elise Shelley. Thank you very much! Yay! <laughs> um, I won't live here as a freeloader. As a research assistant, I get a salary from the school, so I will pay my living expenses. My, I wish my daughter would say something like that. But I don't have an income yet! <laughs> <laughs> Aretha, why don't you show Elise to her room? Okie dokie! Aretha shows me to a room. Ta-da! Here it is. The room isn't big, but it is a hundred times more hospitable than Maison's attic. The floor is sparkling white, and the bed is very cozy. Unlike the bed in my old room, that's only marginally more comfortable than the floor. This is really nice! <laughs> Why don't you take a rest for a few minutes? I'll call you when it's time for dinner. Um, Aretha? Yeah? I haven't seen your dad. Is he still at work? <laughs> I don't have a dad. Oh, I'm sorry. No, don't be. My mom told me that my father left shortly after I was born. That's why I don't have a dad. I see. So it's not because her dad died. That means Aretha and I were both abandoned by our fathers. That makes me feel closer to her, somehow. Well, do take some time to wind down. If you want to take a shower, there's a towel in the wardrobe. Oh, but you'll need mana to turn on the shower. It's okay. I drank a potion in the laboratory this morning. Okay, you should be all set then. Talk to you later. I sit on the bed and stare out of the window. I try to relax like Aretha told me, but my mind keeps wandering about. I remember visiting the school for the first time today, seeing its many enchanting magic machines. I think about casting my magic on the torn paper and wonder if I could be useful for Franz's research. I remember studying in class for the first time, listening to Franz talk about magic systems, even though more than half of what he was saying went completely over my head. I think about Aretha and her mom, and what her mom told me. Magic, even as science, isn't completely rational because humans are irrational. A little bit later, Aretha calls me for dinner. Aretha, Alanis, and I have a long conversation over dinner, mostly about my life before I met Franz. I also tell them how I was abandoned by my parents. Hearing my story almost drives Aretha to tears, whereas Alana seems to be particularly interested, asking me questions about my family. Aretha and I go back to my room after dinner and chat for hours until Alana comes in and tells us to go to bed. As I close my eyes and wait for sleep to come, I realize that today is the first time in so many years that I can sleep in a nice bed like this. It's funny, yesterday, I thought I'd spend the night sleeping on a street somewhere. Two days ago, I still thought my 16th birthday would be my first day as a prostitute. But then the son of a lord took me for a prostitute. I got mad and ran away and decided to never go back to Maison des Beauvois. It's strange, but somehow my life got better because he treated me like the kind of girl I thought I would have to become. It makes me wonder. Is Frederick really as bad as the lords who visit Maison every night? He only thought I worked at Maison des Beauvois because he had seen me there. I guess it's reasonable to assume that any young girl seen near Maison is a prostitute. Do I hate Frederick? I hate Frederick! But of course I hate him! Reasonable or not, he shouldn't have just assumed that I was a whore! And how rude of him to invite me to his home just to ask such a vile question! I'm only a commodity to him! 
No, he isn't any better than the men who go to Maison. I don't ever want to see him again. Stupid, stupid, stupid. I can't believe what an adult I am. What the hell was I saying? Service me, Elise? What the bloody hell was that? What was I thinking? I should have myself flogged. I'm such a fool. I knew that Elise had gone to Maison, but I didn't ask Franz to bring her for that. I could have gone any time if that were the case. I only wanted to see her. I wanted to get to know her. Elise even tried to explain to me why she had been at Maison. But I wouldn't listen. Perhaps she isn't that kind of girl after all. No. In fact, she can't be that kind of girl. Surely she despises me now. What was it that made me lose my mind in that instant? I know. It was her music. Her piano was so beautiful, so captivating that at that moment, I lost myself. I wanted her to belong to me. I wished to own her. Body, mind, and soul. I desired her. She was every bit as heavenly as I imagined her to be. Louise. My lord, are you listening? Yes. The Lord Frederick. I opened my eyes to the sight of my private tutor's unshapely face a foot away from mine. His two thick eyebrows contorted above his too fleshy nose. Elise's beautiful face returns as soon as I close my eyes again. There. That's better. Lord Frederick! What?! It takes incredible self-control not to break this man's nose this very instant. He backs away and sits down on the chair across from me. I'm sorry, my lord, but you haven't been responding to my questions. I was checking to see if you had fallen asleep. I wish I had, you bulbous frog of a man. Aristocrats are too important to be allowed to attend public schools. Therefore... Every morning, a series of tutors come to our house to teach me privately. As I was saying, because magicians unleash magic from their hands, arm exercises have been known to improve magicians' ability to cast stronger magic spells. They build the arm's physical endurance to withstand... Right now, I'm supposed to be studying practical magic, a subject that I normally enjoy, because it isn't boring like magical science and its endless theories. Unfortunately, today, I'm not in the mood to study anything. My mind keeps coming back to Elise. What should I do now? What will I say the next time I see her? Will I even see her again? I heard she ended up being Franz's research assistant, so I may have a chance to meet her again. Maybe I could just go to the conservatoire and pretend to look for Franz. But what would I be looking for him for? Why would the great Lord Frederick Godwin need to meet with a simple student? His research project is the obvious answer, but... No. No, that'd be too strange. I don't even understand the damn project in the first place. Besides, I have nothing to do with the project, and my dispassion for compassion is legendary. And even if I could see Elise, what would I say to her? Hi, Elise. How are you doing? She would scream that I was a pervert. Either that, or she would ignore me. So going to see Franz would be a waste of my time. There's no tricking my way into a confrontation here. There is only one way to make amends. I've got to apologize to Elise. I must tell her I'm sorry. But how? How do I apologize to her if I don't know how to meet her again? Which is why many professional sorcerer players incorporate physical exercises in addition to magic practice into their training. Furthermore... What did you say? I beg your pardon. Please repeat what you just told me. The exact sentence. 
many professional sorcerer players incorporate... That's it! You're a damned genius! I rise up from my chair, with my finger pointed at my tutor's fat, pockmarked nose. Uh, what? By the way, please mind your language, my lord. Your father would be angry if he heard that. That's it! Sorcerer! <laughs> um, my lord? <laughs> my lord, is something wrong? Au contraire! Something is right! When is my next sorcerer match? That would be tomorrow evening, my lord. Make it this evening. W what? I'm going out. You work on rescheduling my match. I rush out of the room without waiting for a reply. M my lord, there's still an hour before you can have your break. And you can't just reschedule your match like that. W what about your... Frederick, uh, hello. <clears throat> so, how is the research going? Well, my opponent was just a beginner, so it really wasn't all that impressive. Oh, he was a beginner? Um, that must be why you only used willpower magic. You must have been going easy on him. The music was wonderful. This is like being at a concert, but more exciting! Yes. Symphony in C minor. Odora di Spirito Adolescente. Is that the title? Wow, I really, really, really loved that piece. Let's do a project. 